Hello everyone, and welcome to uh, the pun there. <laughs> I'm trying to do too many things at once. Welcome to uh, our latest planetarium show. Um, as you can see, we're going live a little bit early because there's something amazing happening tonight, and it is the first all civilian spacecraft launch. Uh, is happening in about four minutes. Um, so we wanted to start off by watching that because this is a historic event. Um, and then we'll go into our regularly scheduled show and we can do introductions and stuff after that. Um, in the comments, I did put the link to uh, Space, SpaceX's live stream if you want to go watch that directly. Um, otherwise, I'm going to throw it up on our screen. Um, and let me turn... us on and they're just being quiet right now yeah you can see we're about four minutes to go and as you can see on the timeline there at the bottom of your screen the strong back retraction is the next major event in fact, the last physical event or modification to the pad prior to liftoff. This. Falcon 9 is nearly fully loaded with almost 100, excuse me, of 1 million pounds of liquid kerosene and liquid oxygen. And that liquid oxygen is what we see venting there, you know, those white clouds. All right, there on your screen, you can see that the strong back is beginning to retract. And Kate, that strong back will move back just a couple of degrees you see here. Then at T0, when the Falcon 9 sends the liftoff command to the ground to release it, hydraulics will bring that strong back the rest of the way to about a 45 degree position at liftoff. Stage one lock load complete. We've got the call out right on time. First stage liquid oxygen loading is complete. Shutting down the ground pumps. We're down to just loading second stage liquid oxygen. And now, under three minutes until the launch of inspiration four. Dragon has transitioned to terminal count and is on internal power. All right, and there's that call out that Dragon is now running on its own power. Um, it is no longer connected to the power systems of Pad 39A. As you just heard, the crowd is super excited here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, as we are now under two and a half minutes uh, until the launch of the Inspiration4 crew. That crew there can be seen on the right-hand side of your screen. Buckled in and ready to go. It might be safe to talk now. Um, so, as I was saying, this is this is a very historic event. These are a full four-person crew of Stage two not trained complete. astronauts. And they are all civilians. Um, the call that Stage Two locks load is Dragon complete. Dragon is an auto idle. Falcon is now fully loaded with all of its propellants. Yes, closeout will begin shortly. Expect loud venting. Announcement to let the crew know that as we vent off various lines on the uh, launch pad, we'll hear some loud noises. Let the crew know that's planned. We're also right now draining liquid oxygen out of the transporter erector, draining the lines, getting ready for launch. Is there a reason they have to fill up the liquid oxygen so close to the launch? Or is it um, just... My guess is temperature needed. Right. Because it has to be real cold, right? Right. Here we go. Go for launch. Inspiration 4 is go for launch. Punch it, SpaceX. Command are calling down. Seconds. Punch it, SpaceX. I have to remember we're streaming and to not start crying. 
T-minus 15 seconds. Vehicles pitching downrange. Stage long propulsion is normal. They go so fast. I know. T plus 30 seconds. Call outs indicate nominal. Historic mission playing the Inspiration 4 crew. On board Dragon and Falcon 9. Great deal with the crew in the council. We're into the throttle down, into the throttle bucket. Stay, do you want to throttle down? Throttling down in preparation for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. And then the Double flight. Nine, supersonic. Stage one, throttle up. We're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. We throttle back up and one Bravo, the call out from space. That's one of the abort sequences. That is a nominal call. Everything continues to be good. How do they not look like terrified? For the crew. I know, the only thing I can think about is like the clench I would have. I know. See. I want to see what their ZRG indicator is. Okay, we heard the call out. MVAC D is chilling. We're beginning to get the turbo pump ready on the second stage engine for ignition. We're passing through 3G's acceleration. Everything continues to look nominal. Three G's pushing on you. What's the? Is it like six where you start to like pass out or something? I believe like that? so. Our hey, engines are throttling down on? for G limiting. Four G's. Four G's. We're holding it there for the crew. Major event coming up will be main engine cutoff, followed by stage separation. Looking at the second stage engine nozzle, and then ignition of the second stage. And Miko. Oh my god, look at the metal he got. I know. Officially, the Inspiration 4 crew are now on their way to space. All right. They're there on the left-hand side. I think we'll stop there, or else I will just watch the entire thing together yeah. on stream. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was amazing. And um, we'll kind of check back in at the end of the stream to make sure, you know, they got in orbit okay. Um, but so this was a SpaceX launch that um, was a Falcon 9 rocket with the Dragon capsule. So this is the same system that we've been sending astronauts to the space station with for a little over a year now. Yep. Um, and now for the first time, they're taking civilians and they're going to spend about three days orbiting around the Earth uh, before coming back down. And it's kind of amazing. Um, I wish them all the best. I definitely don't want to be in their place. Um, I don't think I could survive a rocket, uh, you know, launching. I don't even like flying on a plane. So, um, anyway, let's get back to our normal schedule. Um, welcome everyone. Sorry for that brief, uh, kind of digression from, um, our schedule for tonight, but with this historic launch, we of course wanted to, to watch a little bit of it. Um, but hi, 
I'm Jessica. I am the Planetarium Director. Uh, with me is one of our students who I will let introduce himself. Hi, I'm Eli. I'm a physics and astronomy student at UMD. And uh, tonight we are going to be doing our uh, astronomy fact or fiction show, which is taking a look at kind of common um, ideas and misconceptions, some right, some wrong, uh, and kind of just taking a look at what is right and wrong. Um, this is a show that Eli has been um, revamping. Um, so if you've been to the planetarium, you know, in the past when we were open, uh, you may have seen our Mythbusters astronomy show. Um, this is basically that show, but revamped um, that he's been working on. So this is a preview uh, of what that new show is like. Obviously, we'll have it in the planetarium, full dome experience. Um, but uh, I will let Eli take it away. Uh, as always, if you have any questions throughout the show, feel free to leave them down below. I will keep an eye out for that and we'll let Eli know as questions come up. I'm also going to keep an eye on the uh, crew uh, and see how they're doing and I might pop in with some updates now and then. But uh, Eli, it's all yours. Alrighty. Um, so... How does that look? Does that look okay? Yep, looks good. Awesome. Okay, so... Um, this is um, formatted in such a way that you can kind of play it as like a trivia true false game. So if you guys want to play along while, uh, while the show's going on, um, you're more than welcome to. Um, so we'll start off with the question, true or false, um, the moon has a permanently dark side. We'll give you just a second to think of your answer. So the answer is false. Um, unfortunately, Pink Floyd lied to you. Um, there is not a dark side of the moon. Um, the reason people often believe that there is a dark side of the moon is because there is such thing as a far side of the moon. Um, on Earth, we are always looking at the same side of the moon, um, which we call the near side. Um, the other side for um, a super long portion of human history um, was unknown. Um, we had not had the ability at all to look at it or know anything about it. Um, and therefore the name dark took hold, um, albeit incorrectly, but kind of for the same purpose um, that we call dark matter, dark matter. It's not because it's actually dark. Well, in the case of dark matter kind of is because we don't think it really sees any light, but um, dark in this sense means more so like unknown or kind of mysterious rather than literally dark. So um, dark so energy would be a better analogy. Sure, yeah, so dark energy, yeah, it's just something we don't really know much about. Um, again, dark not really mean, not meaning not illuminated, but just mysterious. Um, the reason there is a far side of the moon is because of something called tidal locking, which basically means that um, because of gravitational interactions between the moon and the earth over millions of years, um, the moon rotates once for every orbit that it makes around the earth. Um, so you can kind of look at this in the image here. Um, without rotation, you can see that um, Earth would not always be looking at the same face of the moon, but with rotation, you can see that as the moon rotates in step with its um, orbit, the same side is always facing. Um, but to make this a little easier to visualize, um, I have this little video here. So um, what's going on is as the moon is orbiting the earth, it's also completing one full rotation, just like it does in real life. And you can see that this side with the craters, those little dark areas, um, is always facing the earth, which is the same effect that we see when we look at the same face of the moon. All right, so we'll go on to the next question. True or false? Astronauts on the International uh, Space Station experience no gravity. Again, I'll give you a second to think of your answer. This is false. Um, well, it may appear that they are untethered by Earth's pole, um, NASA actually just found a way to work around it. There's a little bit of a pun in there. We'll look more into what that means. Um, so this is a good video that um, explains the, the concept of orbiting and free fall, um, not in the terms of a space station, but in the terms of a cannonball, um, as done in a thought experiment um, thought up by Newton uh, a long time ago. To show how gravity works on Earth and in the skies, Newton designed a thought experiment. He imagined firing a cannon from the top of an extremely tall mountain. On his first law of motion, he knew the cannonball would travel in a straight line 
at a constant speed forever. But gravity pulls the ball downward. If its speed is low, the cannonball hits the earth near the mountain. The higher the speed, the farther away the ball lands. If you slow it faster, it comes farther away, even faster, farther away. Even faster, it may go a thousand miles. Even farther, it may actually go almost halfway around the earth and there hit the earth. You can imagine that if its speed were high enough, the cannonball would travel all the way around the earth and settle into orbit. The orbit of the cannonball around the earth was a balancing act between the cannonball's tendency to fly off in a straight line and it's being yanked back towards the center of the earth continuously by the force of gravity. So in Newton's picture of the world, there were two things. The natural tendency of an object to travel in a straight line, which was true on Earth or in space or anywhere. And there was the attraction of gravity, which was true on the surface of the Earth. And it was true up in space. Newton's breakthrough was to see that the moon's orbit around the Earth and a cannonball's motion on Earth were governed by the same law of gravity. So um, again, not super, um, oops, the Excel stop sharing. Um, not super applicable to the um, idea of the International Space Station traveling around the Earth, but um, the same concepts are, are um, causing the phenomena. So um, much like that cannonball we looked at in that object or the satellite here in this image or the International Space Station, just pick your favorite object, um, the cannonball um, thought experiment is analogous to objects orbiting the Earth. Um, they're not the, their motion can best be described as falling toward the earth, but they're moving at a speed such that their falling causes them to curve around the earth as they as they fall. Um, I don't know if it's kind of hard to put this into words, but the result of the combination of that um, forward momentum or you know the object's tendency to move forward after being ejected from the cannon or a rocket, um, in the case of the International Space Station, um, and gravity pulling it downwards, pulls it into this circular and kind of stable orbit around the Earth. Um, but uh, stable is a pretty generous term because um, in order for an object to orbit in a stable fashion, it needs to be traveling a super precise speed. And that speed depends on the mass of the object it's orbiting, as well as um, uh, how far away from the object it is. Um, so in the International Space Station's case, I think it's like 17,000 miles an hour, 17,000 kilometers per second, it's one or kilometers per hour, it's one of those two units, um, and uh, you can see that, I mean, those objects have to move extremely fast, um, and uh, the closer you get to the object that you're orbiting, the faster you have to move. Um, so it really is just a, an art of finding this balancing act. Um, so we can see that gravity um, actually plays a huge, huge part in the motion of the ISS um, and the astronauts inside of it. In fact, the gravity up there is about 90% of what we experience down here. It's just that um, because of that kind of falling motion, I don't know if you can see me, but I'm doing the air quotes, that falling motion, um, they don't, it, it, the astronauts don't experience the sensation of like standing up on something or, you know, like being, you know, resisted, having their motion resisted in any fashion, um, which is kind of what we perceive as weight down here on Earth. So that kind of is what causes that discrepancy. Uh, but gravity itself, it's very much still important. Um, okay, sorry for that extremely long-winded explanation. The next um, true or false question, true or false, the sun is an orange-yellowish color. And I'll give you a second. So this is actually false too, um, and it's not what we would expect by looking at this image, um, but to understand exactly what color is and the nature of this question, I first want to talk about light just a little bit. Um, so light comes in these uh, little discrete uh, packets called photons, um, and photons behave a lot like waves and a lot like particles. Um, but uh, as for the waves part of that, they have characteristics called wavelength, um, which is the distance between two sequential uh, crests or troughs, um, and these wavelengths are what determine their properties. Um, a small range of wavelengths is the visible light spectrum, which is what you're seeing at um, around like 
like the middle here um, in this kind of color diagram. So we've got the uh, visible wavelengths right there. And then as it travels off um, to the uh, invisible wavelengths, we obviously don't see anything. Um, so uh, the light that we can see, visible light, um, goes from wavelengths of about one one hundredth of a micrometer, which I suppose would be what um, one. I'm trying to do scientific notation in my head. What would that be like a millionth of a meter or something like that um, to uh, 10 micrometers. Um, so very small range of light. Um, but uh, as that wavelength increases or decreases within that range, um, we experience different colors. Um, and so here you're looking at um, kind of a image that shows the relationship between um, wavelength and color and temperature as well. So um, the hotter an object gets, um, the smaller uh, wavelength the light that comes off of it has. Um, so for example, an object at uh, 10,000 degrees Kelvin is going to be um, blue, which has very small wavelengths, um, whereas an object at 1,000 degrees Kelvin is going to be red, which has much larger wavelengths. Um, cool stars like red dwarfs, and I should say cool, it does not mean cold, it just means cold relative to the other stars, they're still extremely hot. Um, cool stars like red dwarfs, which have a surface temperature of about 3000 Kelvin, which um, is a little bit less than the sun. The sun is like somewhere around 5,570 Kelvin, is that right, Jessica? Yeah, somewhere it's around? it's about five to 6,000, I think 5,700. Yeah, somewhere around there. Um, I know there's a seven and a couple fives, um, but um, hotter stars like our sun, which is not the hottest class of star, but hotter than red dwarfs, um, have a surface temp. Uh, oh, right here, I've got 5,300 Kelvin. Um, that peaks about 550 nanometers. Um, and uh, hotter stars like blue giants peak at 450 nanometers. So you can see that as you travel along the color spectrum, um, you're uh, progressing to shorter and shorter wavelengths. Um, so what we see is that in space, when our view is unobstructed by the atmosphere or anything like that, um, we see a white sun. Um, and that's because the sun emits a lot of different colors at once. Um, it's just that um, the peak is kind of in the middle of the visible light spectrum. Um, and when all those colors combine, um, we get white, um, just like we know when um, all the colors go through a prism, they turn into a white beam or vice versa. Um, whereas um, when we're on the surface of the earth, um, that all of those light uh, wavelengths kind of split up. So you get your blues separated from your reds. And depending on the orientation of you in the atmosphere, different colors of those wavelengths are going to get scattered. So during the daytime, blue light gets scattered very well. And um, that's why when you look up at the sky, it looks blue. I suppose it's dark now and also really cloudy. But um, when you look up at the clear daytime sky, it looks blue. Um, and that's because that blue light is bouncing off of all these atoms in the atmosphere and coming at your eyes from all directions. Um, whereas the kind of yellow light that you would receive in your eyes if you look directly at the sun, which you shouldn't do, um, is kind of unobstructed by the atmosphere. It kind of stays in its focused beam coming from the sun. So you see it focused in that area. And then as you progress into nighttime, um, you've got a lot more atmosphere to travel through before the light hits you. That red starts to scatter too, which is why we get those really pretty kind of orange red skies in the evening and the uh, in the uh, morning. Um, so that is um, the color of the sun um, in space unobstructed by an atmosphere is white. Um, whereas if you're on a planet that has an atmosphere, depending on the time of day and the thickness of the atmosphere, different amounts of light in different colors are going to reach your eyes and determine what color you see. Alrighty, um, the next question, true or false, a light year is a measurement of distance. Give me just a moment. This, uh, this picture is really cool. You can see, can you see my mouse? So you can see right here, while you guys are thinking of your answers, you can see right here, this little like bending streak of light right there. Um, that's from an effect called gravitational lensing. What you're looking at here is a, a big cluster of galaxies. Um, and that cluster of galaxies, um, the collective gravity of all those galaxies is um, bending the light of galaxies behind it into kind of a ring shape. Um, so you get this little thing. If it were making a full ring, which we do see happen, it's called an Einstein ring, which is pretty cool. Um, anyway, the answer is true. Um, I remember we talked about this, uh, this little aside that I take with scientific notation. It's not really useful, I don't think. I think it's sufficient for me to just say um, that light travels a really far distance. Um, as you can see right here, we've got 
Okay, I have to kind of count. Um, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions. So um, light travels 587 trillion miles per year, which looks disgusting and is terrible to write out um, if you're writing it out in that unit. Um, and uh, objects are super far away. Um, so we don't really say light travels in miles per year. We just say it travels in light years because um, it makes writing it down a lot less painful and um, it's more useful for practical, um, I guess, practical and astronomy we don't really go together all the time, but um, for astronomical purposes. So rather than saying um, light travels 587 trillion miles per year, we just say it travels a light year, which is the distance that light travels a year, um, which is 587 trillion miles. Um, and you can see writing that out would get really disgusting if we tried to talk about um, different objects in space. Um, the sun is eight light, light minutes away, which is way easier than saying however, writing out an astronomical unit in um, in uh, meters, because that's nasty. Um, and then like, for example, the uh, other side of the Milky Way is 52,000 light years away. And um, even further than that, the closest galaxy to the Milky Way is uh, two and a half million light years away. So you can imagine how disgusting writing out all of those um, zeros would be. Uh, much easier to just say two and a half million light years, which already has a lot of zeros on it. Um, uh, oh, this is cool too. Um, the next question, true or false? Um, it is significantly easier to balance an egg on the equinox. Give you guys a second. I had never heard of this previous to writing this show, um, but it's pretty interesting. Um, and I got to do some math for this answer, which is fun for me. Yeah, I really enjoy this one. Um, all right, so the answer is False. Um, the position of the Earth around the sun has a negligible effect on your ability to balance an egg. Um, so apparently there's this big craze where um, on equinoxes, uh, people would balance eggs on tables or, you know, surfaces, and they thought it was way easier to balance the egg on the surface on the equinox because of the alignment of the Earth and the sun. Um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because um, that would only ring true for people at the equator, um, and I'll show why here. Um, so an equinox means that the sun is directly um, above the equator. Um, and I think the idea going into it was that since there's no like horizontal component to the gravitational force exerted by the sun, like it's not pulling it to the side at all, it would just be pulling it directly up. It would be way easier to balance the egg. But like I said, that only makes sense for people on the equator. Anyone who's at all off the equator would be experiencing a somewhat sideways um, force of gravity um, exerted by the sun. And uh, up here in Duluth, we never get the sun directly overhead. So it really doesn't make sense for us. There's no day of the year that would make it easier. Um, and uh, let's just imagine a hypothetical uh, situation where the sun is directly overhead um, and see if it worked. Um, if the sun were directly overhead an average sized egg, which is about two ounces in mass, um, the gravitational force it would exert, exert on that egg would be about 0.06% as strong as the force exerted on it by the Earth. Um, that already in and of itself is pretty negligible and it really would not contribute to the motion of the egg um, whatsoever. Um, again, assuming that the egg is two ounces in weight and is sitting on a plywood table, um, the force of friction between it and the table that prevents it from rolling over is 112 times stronger than the force of the gravity were it acting sideways instead of up and down. The only reason I know that is because I was looking up like the friction force between an egg and different surfaces and I found a paper from like 1930 where somebody put in the work to figure that out. Um, I wonder if it has been used in any application other than this. Um, also, the friction that air provides against the motion of the egg would counteract the sun's gravity pretty easily. Um, thus, the gravity would not influence the egg's motion at all, and it would remain upright. Um, the difficulty of balancing, egg, balancing an egg does not um, lay with the force of gravity and its direction, but rather the difficulty of finding the balance point of an egg, which is really hard. Um, eggs are pretty perfectly rounded, and you would have to find the exact bottom of the egg to balance it on, which is one singular point on the egg surface. And that's also assuming that the inside of the egg is kind of like even. 
Um, so in conclusion, it's possible, but extremely difficult to balance an egg on any day of the year. You just need to find that sweet spot. I do know um, a little hack to doing this is to sprinkle salt on the surface that you're trying to balance the egg on. So if you want to impress your friends, sprinkle salt or maybe sugar um, on the surface and then balance the egg because it kind of creates this hard to see little nest for you to rest the egg in. And I will say, uh, like, one of the reasons I like this is it's really good at showing, I guess it's a form of confirmation bias. Where, like, people heard this, and so they tried, hey, I'm going to balance an egg on the Equinox, and oh my god, I got it to work, this must be right. But they never tried it on any other day. So they just assumed that because right. they were able to get it on that day, what they heard must be correct. Um, and this is something you can easily test. I mean, we have an Equinox coming up, so try balancing an egg over the next few days, and uh, see for yourself whether or not it makes a difference if we're on an Equinox or not. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, this is probably gonna have to be the last question just because we're almost out of time here. Um, but this is kind of an interesting one nonetheless. Um, true or false, NASA spent millions of dollars researching space pens um, that would work in space while Russian astronauts simply brought pencils. I know this is one that I heard a lot on the playground in elementary school, uh, but I'll give you a second to come up with your answer. It's definitely one that makes its way around social media periodically. Yeah, yep, yeah, for sure. All right, big reveal. The answer is false. Um, both began by using pencils in space, NASA and um, the Soviet Union. Um, and they independently um, developed and bought space pens from separate companies. Um, like I said, independent of one another. Um, so, I'm sure all of you have heard of this controversy at some point. Um, the story goes that for the Apollo missions, NASA scientists racked their brains and spent millions of dollars developing a pen uh, that can be used in outer space. Um, you couldn't use a pen used on Earth in space as the gravity of Earth pulls the ink down to the tip of the pen for writing. So if you don't have present gravity or you're counteracting gravity by orbiting around the Earth, um, you wouldn't be able to write with it. So NASA sought to develop a pen that was usable in outer space. Um, the kicker of the whole story is that Russia gave their cosmonauts a pencil for like 10 cents a piece. Um, while it's funny and um, entertaining, it's not actually true. Um, both American and Russian uh, astronauts or cosmonauts um, used pencils in space. Um, the pencils used by Americans, however, didn't come cheap. Uh, in fact, they were mechanical pencils bought from Ticam Engineering for almost $130 a pop, um, which is insane. Um, there is a basis behind the myth, um, however, as NASA quickly ordered for space pens upon their independent invention by Fisher Pens. Um, they abandoned the mechanical pencils for a few reasons. Um, number one, the public didn't react too favorably to NASA spending almost $5,000 on pencils. And two, um, bits of pencil lead would chip off and enter the spacecraft's air circulation system. And that's really not good for you to breathe in graphite or lead. Um, so a couple downsides to it. Um, Fisher Pen spent over a million dollars developing the space pen, and it was money well spent um, because NASA and the Soviet space program both invested in them, buying them for a much more reasonable $2.98 per pen. Um, but they bought a lot of them, so Fisher Pens definitely made their money back. Um, so rather than spending $5,000 on pencils, the organization spent collectively millions of dollars on pens. Um, not only does it allow the user to write in microgravity, extreme temperatures underwater or over Greece, which I don't really understand, but it was also used by Apollo 11 astronauts to return to Earth safely. Um, as one of the astronauts was climbing back into the lunar module, um, their life support pack um, hit and broke the switch that engaged the uh, engine that would power their return to the lunar orbiter, which is awful. Um, and having abandoned their tools on the moon to allow more uh, lunar rocks um, to be in the, in the cabin, um, they really didn't have any way to fix it. And there was really nothing they could do. You can't go back out once you've gone in. So they couldn't go grab their tools and they were without facility to fix this switch. And without the switch, they couldn't get back to Earth. They would stay there forever. Um, but after quick thinking by NASA scientists and one of the astronauts, um, a space pen was literally jammed into the hole and switched to actually start the engine so it saved their lives. Um, and with that, I have gone a little bit over, so I'm going to stop sharing. Do we have any updates on the... Um, um, so 
Falcon, the Falcon 9, uh, landed safely on the drone ship, um, and the Dragon capsule is on its way to orbit. Everything okay. is looking good. The Zero-G Indicator is a stuffed golden retriever. That's cute. Um, which is adorable. And it was really cute. So Zero-G Indicators are a fancy name for a plushie that the astronauts take with them that once it starts floating, they know that they are in an orbit and in you know, zero G, but as Eli has taught us, it's not actually no gravity, you're just in orbit, but it shows that you are in orbit and becomes weightless by floating around. And of course it's a plushie because you don't want anything hard banging around in the capsule and hitting buttons that it shouldn't. Um, so I have a question, I don't know if I've asked you this before, but why did they go for that particular mechanical pencil? I have no idea. Um, I, and I, I never saw anything um, when I was looking it up. Um, I imagine it has something to do um, with uh, like the spring system that pushes the lead forward. Because um, I don't really think mechanical pencils were like a thing at that time. Like I think they were kind of I mean, I, wouldn't, I won't say that's the only reason they were made, but I think mechanical pencils kind of came to be because of that, that process. Because I remember, I remember seeing something about um, how like with regular pencils, um, like the, uh, I forget how they, how they said it, but it was something about like how much you would have to push on the paper to get the graphite to rub off was also like sufficient to like break the lead or something like that yeah so, like, and then you like, also have the having to sharpen it right yeah um so i think they just went for mechanical pencils for that purpose and i think that's kind of the reason mechanical pencils hit the scene but um 130 dollars pencil is a little steep so yeah but if it if that is true and it was kind of the start then they didn't have the know-how to to manufacture them Right. As easily, maybe. Yeah. Also, the mechanical pencil companies didn't, uh, they weren't hurt too bad by NASA signing up because I'm sure I, I would be interested to see what the revenue of. Yeah. I mean, that's all I use. Do. Yeah, me too. Me too. Awesome. Um, well, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, so if anyone does have questions, now is a great time to leave them in the comments. Um, we'll take a couple minutes to see if anything comes through. In the meantime, I can tell you what's coming up over the next week. Um, on Saturday is our next edition of Ask an Astronomer, um, where we will have um, a couple of us here to answer your questions, anything astronomy related, or honestly, even not. Let's, let's see what you got. Um, we'll also talk about some current events. I'm sure we'll give an update on this launch and how everything went, because um, that should be... Thursday, Friday. That should be around the time they, they touch back down. Mm -hmm. um, so we can talk about that. Um, and yeah. Uh, next Wednesday is our uh, rescheduled uh, tour of the solar system. We were supposed to have on Saturday. Uh, we ended up having to cancel. Um, and apologies for that. But we are planning on doing it next Wednesday. And then next Saturday is the next edition of our exploration series, where we're going to take an up-close look at galaxies, which is a topic that is near and dear to both mine and Eli's hearts. And I'm so excited to have a chance to talk about it. Um, I'm going to have the same problem I always have with these exploration shows, that I'm probably going to do too much. Because there's just so much to talk about. Yeah. Um, so I'm very excited to be doing that one. All right, I am not seeing any questions, so I think we're good to wrap up. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, definitely check us out. We stream regularly on Wednesdays and Fridays at 7 p.m. Central. Um, we will have information on Halloween coming out very soon. We are finalizing some details right now, um, but we're, we're excited to, to kind of get that news out. And, yeah, uh, have a great rest of your week, and we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.